continue the series of Sirke Avot, and today it's number seven. And Baruch Hashem, I'm happy that I hear many people are already asking when is going to be number seven. That's mean people following up on it, so it's good. Very good. Okay, so I just uh, refresh your memory what we, where we finished last week. Uh, we were speaking about uh, the best advice for human being is to be quiet as much as possible. To only talk when it's necessary. The more we talk, the shorter the life is. Because a person has X amount of words that he can speak in his life, that's besides words of Torah. That doesn't count. There's no limit. But if a person is speaking about ha and da, everything that he needs for every day's life, there's X amount of words that he can say in his lifetime. If he talks too much, it's like using the battery too many hours a day. You don't have the battery anymore. So that's the advice. Uh, Rabbi Shimon says, all my life I grew up with the Chachamim, with the biggest rabbi who were coming to visit in my house to learn, and I learned one thing from them. Obviously there's millions of things to learn from them. But what is the thing he highlights the most? That they only spoke when they had to speak. Otherwise, you never hear them say, ah, how's the weather? How is the game? How is your new car? How do you feel? How's your wife feeling? How's the new baby? What do you get from this? What do you get from this? Just focus on what's important in life. Don't get me wrong, it's not a sin. You can talk, as long as you're not talking about bad things and sins, then it's not a sin. But this is something that gets you used to, look, to waste time. Like sometimes you see people come, uh, let's say on uh, Shavuos night, they come to Monsi to the Yeshiva to learn with us all night. Or Shana Rabba, right? let's say Shana Rabba. You see right away people that likes to talk about nonsense, even when they come to learn, they, for one hour maybe they learn 10-15 minutes. They have to talk, it's like, it's like an addiction. They're about nonsense. So how is it? So how long are you here? So what do you do? Where do you work? Where is your office? In the end, he comes to learn with the rabbi. 45 uh, minutes from an hour was wasted on nonsense. But if a person knows I have to talk, the more divrei Torah I talk, the better it is. This is where we finished last time. Also, one thing that I didn't finish that Mishnah, it says like this, Chaviva Adam Shenivra B'Tselem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu loved the people more than any other species in nature. There's two million different animals that we know. From all the animals, from everybody who can breathe in this world, the mankind is the most important in the eyes of Hashem. He loves them the most because we were created in His image. Not physical image, like some people make a big mistake and think that Hashem has an image in a spiritual image of Hashem, which means He's merciful, we have mercy in us. He's generous, we have generosity in us. But we also have the opposite. We have everything that Hashem gave us, and we have what the Satan is giving us. And that's the battle of life. Who are you going with? With Hashem or with the Satan? Hashem say go to the Yeshiva, the Satan say go to watch the NBA Finals. Who are you listening to? You listen to the Satan? A black mark in your notebook. Tomorrow, the same thing, to wake up in the morning, to go to shul, to pray like a kosher Jew, or to wake up in the last minute and pray two minutes on the way to your car or in the bus. This is Hashem, this is the Satan. Everything in life, it's either this or this. As the Torah says, I'm giving you the life and the good, the bad and the dead, and you should choose the good, the life. You can also choose the bad. It's 100% your own choices. So this is it. So Adam, all people, our descendants of Adam, all kind, all mankind. When Hashem loves mankind just because they were created in His own image. He created us in His own image. But from all mankind, who does He love the most? Israel. The nation of Israel. Why? Because they deserved, they deserved to receive the Torah because of their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thanks to those three legendary figures, their descendants benefits from their righteousness and they receive the Torah which is the most important jewel of the creator of the world. This is where we finished last time as the last words of the last Mishnah We said in a Mincha on Shabbat before we start to pray in a Shul right after we put the Sefer Torah back it's very important verse 
קצין משלי קינג סלומון רולט, of course, ברוח הקודש, כי לקח טוב נתתי לכם, לקח means to learn a lesson. There's many ways to learn a lesson, from your mistake, from other people's mistake, from the punishments you're getting, you learn a lesson. But the best way to learn a lesson is to know before the, the, the problems coming, before the tragedies begin, to learn ahead of time. Like we say in Hebrew, מקדים תרופה למכה, preparing the medicine before the sickness even occurred. Why? In case something goes wrong, I'm already prepared with my antibiotic. What is it, the Torah? Torah ti al ta'azovu. You want to be successful, Hashem say to every Jew, never leave my Torah. Rav Chacham ben Zion, Abba Shaul say on a pasuk, there's one pasuk, he's saying, ta'azveni yom yomayim ezveka. If you're going to leave me one day, I will leave you for two days. Measure for measure, but double. So he changed the way you read this pasu. This is what he says. Just to give us an idea, he says, Tazveni yom, yomayim. If you leave me one day or two days, ezveka. God forbid for good. He changed where the dot is. He changed the meaning of the, of the verse. Okay, but of course, it's not the truth, but just the idea to tell you that sometimes a person is messing up his life so much that Hashem is leaving him. When did Hashem left the nation of Israel almost completely in a generation of the Holocaust? Why there are many Jews who are upset about it? They get angry. Everybody has to be upset that a third of our nation were destroyed. They were helpless. They just like, they couldn't do anything about it. But the idea is that the Torah already spoke about the Holocaust. And the Torah said, this is a result of leaving my religion, leaving my Torah, being ungrateful to me. One day will come and I will hide myself away from them and, and close my eyes. And I will not be there. Why? For the nerve that they had to say, God is not watching over us. That's what they think. That's what they're going to get. We pay the price. It's not so, it's not so simple. Until today, we are suffering from that. We're still uh, survivors in the world. But this is it. Now we're continuing. We're still in chapter 3 out of 6 chapters all together. And we are now in a 15 Mishnah of chapter 3. This is a topic by itself. Of course, I can speak about it alone about 10 hours straight now. We don't have the time. I have a whole lecture about free choice about the choice, I should, I should say. Just briefly about this Mishnah, this is what the Mishnah says. Akot Tzafui, everything is predicted. Ve'arishut netuna, but the permission is given. So everything is predicted, but every person has permission to do whatever he feels like, whatever he wants to do. In a way, it's a contradiction. If everything is predicted, it's an indication that there's no permission to do whatever you want. You're a robot. Why? Everything is predicted. And the moment you're born, everything was already predicted. You, Hashem knew where you're going to go, what you, who you're going to marry, what, what we think you're going to do. If you're going to die wicked or righteous, everything is already preset for you. Why? If Hashem knew what's going to be the end, that means you have no other way. You had to go according to His knowledge. Because if you would change according to His knowledge, that means He didn't know. It's a very problematic subject. So, as I said in my lecture, the Greeks, the Jews, and the Muslims have three different opinions about it. The Greeks, because they came to this contradiction, they didn't know how to explain. So they decided that Akadosh Baruch Hu, God does not know the future. It cannot be otherwise. He said, since we see that we have a free choice, the Greeks could not deny that a person can choose whatever he wants to do. So they decided that it cannot be that Hashem knows the future. He can do anything, but he cannot know the future. And that's their idea. The Muslims, they say everything is predicted and there's no choice. Everything is min Allah, they say, from Hashem. Whatever happened was supposed to happen. If I die, it's supposed to happen. If I lost the money, it was supposed to happen. If I killed somebody, it's not in my head, it was supposed to happen. But the Muslims, they're very good in speeches, but in reality they do the, everything the opposite of what they preach. Why? Because if you come and preach to your student in Islam that everything was supposed to happen, it's all been a shaman in everything. Why do you have jails? Why do you have a court? Why do you have police? It's not fair. 
everything was decided, and everybody is a robot, and this is what's supposed to happen. So when a person murdered us, when a person stole, Hashem told him to do it, so leave him alone, poor guy. It's a robot, Hashem is moving with the remote control. So not only Hashem moved him and pressed the button, still, $200, still. And the robot went and stole $200 from somebody's jeans in the locker room. Now you want to give him a punishment? Doesn't make sense. You cannot say something foolish which is completely the opposite of what you do in everyday life. But if you think it's only the Muslims, I have news for you. Many of the secular Jews are just behaving in the same foolish ways. They say the same things, but in Israel you also have court, police, everything, no? So the answer is it's baloney, it's nonsense. Judaism is the only authentic religious that knows all the answers to all the questions. And what does the Torah say? There's no contradiction. The knowledge of Hashem about the future has no interference with the choices of the human being. It's still very difficult to understand, so the Rambam writes. The Rambam writes, you should know, that every person has the permission to do whatever he wants and there is no power or energy that attracts them to any one of the sides, to the positive or to the negative. No magnet that pulls you to the bad side or to the good side. It's 100% equal choice between good and bad in every step you do in your life. And as an example, the Rambam used, first of all, that the Torah was given to the Jews. If the Torah was given to the Jews and half of the Torah is warnings and punishments, what's the point? I'm a robot, why are you punishing me? Why are you giving me warning? I cannot do otherwise. Whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do. So, so what's the point of writing me all these punishments in the Torah? There are a hundred punishments there in the Torah. Some of them is execution. Cannot be that Hashem is going to execute a person when the person have never decided what he's going to do. And Hashem decided for him to, do, to make a sin. So obviously the Rambam said the fact that Hashem gave us the Torah and he writes in the Torah, you should choose the good. There's no arguments. We should choose the good. It's in our head. Also, Hashem sent many prophets throughout the generation. Be careful, change your evil way, make repentance. If we were robots, why is he wasting his time sending us a, a messenger to warn us? It's, a, it's, all a, it's a game that is already sold. Before it started, it's over. What? So the Rambam says, obviously, for sure, we have a choice. However, it's very difficult for us to understand. So he writes, the answer to this question is wider than the ocean, which means if you take the, all the water in the ocean and put it in your pen as an ink, you still won't finish to answer the answer to the choice, to this subject that called choice, that we choose what to do. However, the Rambam writes like this. You should know, the Gemara says that 40 days before a person is created, an angel come and take a drop of seed from a husband and wife that were together tonight, let's say, when is the baby is going to be fully prepared? 40 days after the act. Which means, in the night that they are together, the angel come and take a drop of seed and comes to Hashem, to the court of heaven. And he say, dear God, what's the fortune of this drop? And they have to make a decision. The court of heaven, which soul from all the people who are waiting to be reincarnated, will be come, coming to this family. So if this husband, his name is Yosef, and his wife is Miriam, Yosef and Miriam now is receiving a new soul. What is it going to be? In a body of a male or in a body of a female? How does Hashem decide? Depend on the purpose of that soul. If that soul needs to pass the test of a woman, like modesty and raising children and all this, then he put the soul in a body of a woman, and then the mitzvot that applies to females. If it's a man, if he needs to pass mitzvot of a man, such as learning Torah, or working, supporting his children, teaching them Torah, all these things, then he puts the soul in the body of a man, and that's how he designed the test. But this is only one way that Hashem designed the test. There's millions of other things. For instance, rich or poor, it's decided for you. Generally, if you have comfortable life financially, or poverty, it's pre-decided. If you be foolish or a genius or something in between it's all this pre-decided for yes of course you can develop your brain to become smarter over the years but what is your beginning point 
You have a sharp brain or you have a foolish brain? It's pre-decided. If you're going to have healthy life or miserable life as far as health, it's pre-decided. If you're going to be handsome or ugly, it's pre-decided. Who are your parents? It's decided. So basically everything is decided except one. The Gemara says, the Gemara is the oral Torah in case you didn't know, Tzadik or Rasha lo neemar. To be righteous or wicked was not pre-decided for the person. It's 100% in his hand. If he want to be like Moshe, like Moshe Rabbeinu, like Moses, he has full permission to be. And if he wants to be wicked, like Yerovam ben Navad, there was a very wicked king about 2,500 years ago. So if he wants to be wicked like that king, it's also in his hand. Now let me explain to you one last thing, and before we move on, that you should know how it works. In reality, if the future did not arrive yet, how does Hashem know the future? The future does not exist. There's no future anywhere. You can only know it in imagination. It's predicting that's where this person would end. Because he's going to do this, he's going to do that, he's going to do that, and that's where he's going to end. And that's the next person, and the next person, and then Hashem has to put everything together. Millions of different knowledges together and put the whole picture together. It's very complicated. We no, have no idea how it does the work. But one thing I want you to understand, since HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not depend on time, time exists only where material exists. Only where material exists. And Hashem has no material in Him. It's all spiritual. So time, for us, time is A, B, C, D. Today, tomorrow, the next day, this is time. Everything we do depends on time. Walking, eating, sleeping, whatever. Everything we do is depend on time. But for Hashem, time does not exist. So, which means, the name of Hashem in the Torah appears in four letters. Yud, Hei, Vav, and Hei. From those four letters you write, Haya, which is the past in Hebrew, Bove, which is the present, Ihiye, which is the future, past, present, and future, all three in the name of Hashem, to show us that Hashem does not depend on time. What does it mean, does not, is not subject to time? This is what it means. In the same second that Hashem created the world and made the world running for 6,000 years, as the Torah told us, 6,000 years maximum, that second that He created the world, it's also over for Him. Now I made you very confused, I know. The second that He made it, it's basically over. Why? Because all three times for Him is the present. Now a person cannot understand it, because from the minute that the person started to crawl on a rug, everything he learned in his life is subject to time. A person in his computer does not have an understanding how can you do a function that does not depend on time. You cannot understand. It's like putting into your computer Hebrew letters and the computer doesn't have Hebrew. The computer will not react. The computer cannot understand. You can try a million years to put letters in here. It's just not going to work. Same thing us. We can try millions, millions of years to understand the secret of this world. We are not divine. We cannot understand it because we are material. But I can give you a little bit of an hint to understand how it works. Since Hashem made it, and we are in the middle of the process, we are here for who knows how many times. We're a different body here. We continue to come. Maybe we'll come again. We are running as the process is continuing, but for Hashem it's basically over. That's what it means Hashem knows the future. He, he made now the present, He can go 6,000 years to the future and see how the world ended and what mark each soul received. Soul number one, 70. Soul number two, 75. Soul number three, 79. Soul number four, 99. Soul number seven, 20. Why does he know it? Because he can travel to the future, you understand? Because the future, no matter even if it's a million years ahead, it's the same like the present for you. And we do not understand how can it be. That means to know the future. But at the time that he set the test for us, there was no future yet. That means we have a hundred percent free choice to create our future. And we are creating our future. What is it like? Like the GPS, the navigation. Today is very popular, almost every car has it. This is exactly how it works. I'm so glad that they invented that machine. Why? 
It's a Musar lecture. It's better than to buy a whole book. Just from the way this machine works, you understand how the life of an individual is programmed. For instance, before you heading to your destination, you put an address. So you start in your house. This is the day you're born. And when you're going, uh, I don't know, two hours ride, you have to go north somewhere, you put an address, this is the day you'll die. From here to here, this is your life. Now in life, there are millions of ways to get to your destination. You can go on a highway, you can go on a different highway, you can go through the streets, you can go on bridges, you can, I don't know, there's so many different ways. Every change of a plan changes your entire future. Let's give an example. The computer told you, start driving forward. You drive five blocks, you're supposed to make a right. If you make a right, a minute after you have the highway, and it's free right. Everything is easy. Since you missed that right, now you're 18. That was the right turn. You're 18. They offer you two different girls. Rich, beautiful, but not righteous at all. Not so beautiful, average, not so rich. Big righteous girl. Now it's the turn. You make the turn or you don't. If you choose the wrong choice, from now on all your future is different. It will never be the same. Your children will not be what they're supposed to be with the righteous girl. Your parnasa will not be the same. Your Torah will not be the same. Your eternity and your children's eternity will never be the same. One second of the wrong turn change your entire eternity. And it's every second. It's now you came to the lecture, your eternity will never be the same. The next thing you do in an hour from now, your eternity will never be the same. It's like a card game in a casino. You take one card out, all the cards in the table will never be the same. Which means, right now you made the choice, I marry her. From this moment on, let's say if you marry Miriam, you would end it up as a chief rabbi of the whole world. Why? She would push you to learn, she would give you Musar, she would kick you out of the house if you don't learn. She said, I don't want you. Just give me a guess. Okay, I don't have a choice. Okay, let me go learn. Okay, relax, relax, relax. You know, they will change your entire life. The other girl, I want to drop me in a beauty salon. You know, I have an appointment. What happened? You just were there yesterday. No, but tonight is a wedding. What should I wear tonight? Take me to the mall. I'm depressed. Why are you going to the yeshiva? You're leaving me alone. What kind of husband you are? I want you every night with me. No, with this kind of life, what do you expect? Twenty years later, you see that you made the wrong turn in a GPS. You ended up in Alabama. Supposed to be. Why are you over there? She got you there. This is what this is what life is all about. Every choice you make, they're offering you two jobs. One job in Las Vegas, a million dollar a year. One job in Monsi, fifty thousand dollars a year. Most people, right away, they prepare their suitcases. Where are you? I'm on the way to Vegas. Why? A million dollars. But once you made the wrong turn and you ended up in Vegas, yeah, you get a million dollars. But you become a gambler, you become a drinker, you go and make scenes with all the girls over there. The next thing, you have a kid, you made an abortion, so now you became a murderer. Twenty years later, your kids are big drug dealers. Why? Because you wanted a million dollars. One choice. It changed your eternity. Over here, and over here, and this is how life is. And don't ever believe that it was supposed to be. Why your kids are like this? That's what Hashem wanted. Beloni! Hashem didn't want him to be Esav. He wanted him to be Yaakov. But the choices that you made, and the schools that you put him in, because you were stingy, that's what ended up. Uh, why, uh, why are you like this, you know? Why are you suffering? Why are you so sick? What do you want from me? It's not in my hand, it's in your hand. Some sicknesses come to the person because of his sins. See in the Torah. Where does it say in the Torah that Hashem make us sick when He wants to wake us up? It says, Kol ha-machala asher samti b'mitzrayim, v'chol ha-machala asher lo samti b'mitzrayim avi alechem. I'm going to make you sick with all the sicknesses that are familiar to you from Egypt, and those sicknesses who are you not familiar with. So it says, or it also in a, it says in the Torah, Ki ani Hashem rofecha, I'm your God, your doctor. Your medicine, your health depend on my decision, but I make my decision not based on your beauty, based on your behavior. And that's why humanity refused to understand. You eat what you cook. You have no other way. You put the good spices, you enjoy your food. You put the wrong spices, you vomit. And that's what life is all about. So, forget about the Greeks, 
forget about the Muslims, forget about the secular Jews, it's all nonsense. The answer is right in the Torah in many different places, no contradiction. It's hard to understand? No problem, we are not divine. The Rambam writes, Ilu yeda ativ, aitiv. Translation, if I would know everything about God, I would be Him. It's not the way to know Him, unless if I'm Him. Right? Let's say there's a great doctor, 30 years brain surgeon, famous all over the world. They come to some guy, I want you to tell me everything about him. What do you mean? In order for me to comment about him, I have to go now and, and learn to be a brain surgeon and do who knows how many surgeries for 30 years, maybe I'll be like him. If I'm not like him, can I comment on him? Don't have an understanding of how he makes his surgeries. I don't understand what he does, he press here, he cuts here, he, all kinds of things he does, I'll never know. I, don't know. I can write an article about him, what do I know about him? You got it? This is how it works. So let's continue. The next Mishnah, this is what it says. This world is like a supermarket, like a grocery store. Everything is ready on the shelves. Soon we'll, we'll explain what it means. The store is always open. The owner, the Chenvani, the owner of the grocery store, has a notebook. You can take whatever you want at any time you want, and the hand is always writing. Your debt, how much you owe. So while the hand is riding, also there are some collectors who come back and forth. The collectors come to knock some people's door, excuse me, Mr. X, you owe a thousand dollars, give us some money. The owner send me to collect. And now, excuse me, Mr. Y, you owe money. They come, they take. They don't ask you permission to come knock on your door, because when you owe money, nobody needs your permission, they just knock on your door. I came to collect what you owe, but they are the messenger of the big boss. They're working for him, collectors, like collection agency, right? They hire them, they do the job. Whether the person ready for them, whether he's not. Whether he agree that they come, whether they disagree. They always have who to count on, and everything is ready for the meal all the time. Translation now, this is the language of the Mishnah. Means the grocery store is the world. The owner is Hashem. Hashem does everything that we take, there's a price for it. Whatever you take here, there's a price to pay. You cannot just do whatever you want, right? So you stole, you took something, you made a scene, everything has always been written. Once in a while, Hashem has chance. He doesn't come right away to call it. Once in a while, he sends somebody, hey, knocks on your door, hey, you owe $10,000, give me 500 right away. If not, we close your account. Close your account, that means three seconds, no oxygen, you're finished. So, give something. What does it mean, give something? Accident, surgery, you lost your wallet, somebody robbed your house, your wife just lost a credit card and somebody charged $15,000 on it. That's called collections. Hashem makes collections. The Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan was a very handsome man. Such a beautiful man. He didn't have beard growing, so he looked like a woman. He had peot. Such face. He was, you know, very pretty. One time he was going to the mikveh, the lakes. They used to have mikveh in the lake. Not like today, five million dollar mikveh with fleshy lights and perfumes and beautiful marble made in Italy. Why they make the mikveh so nice? To attract the ladies to come. Because the ladies have a reputation, uh, mikveh it's primitive, it's dirty, it smells. <laughs> when they go to Hilton Hotel to, to dip inside the bathroom of all the kids there in the pool, it's no problem. All the, the oil, the sweat, what the kids do in the pool, she goes like this, ah. <laughs> well, then she goes to the mikveh, which the water are sterilized, clean, they, they check it twice a week, uh, everything you can think of. <laughs> so, it's, so that's why they make seven, ten million. Rabbi, I want to take you to the mikveh, somebody told me a few days ago. I said, well, why, what's so special about it? I said, no, I just want you to see the place. <laughs> it become like a tourist in place, you know? So, this is it. So, Rabbi Yochanan goes to the mikveh. What is the mikveh? The lake. One gangster, Rish Lakish, criminal, walked by, so a beautiful woman is swimming there. What the gangster do when you see a beautiful woman in the lake? Like a tiger, you know? He 
Shav sleeve, Mark Spitz, seven gold medals. Two minutes later, Rabbi Yochanan turned his face. <laughs> it's a man. So Rabbi Yochanan said, I know why you came so fast all the way here. Don't worry. I have a sister. She's much prettier than me. And I'm willing even to give you my sister, the head of the gangsters. In one condition, you come tomorrow morning to my yeshiva and start learning with me Hevruta every day. Why? You, you kill two birds with one stone. First, you save a Jew. It's not just another Jew. It's the head of all the criminals. You get him out of his gang, you knock down the whole gang, no? <laughs> so, it's like you say, really? Serious? Me? Somebody ignorant like me? I don't know anything. Don't worry, I have patience. They took him in. He was a genius. He made him a very big rabbi. They were learning equally. He got to his level. Rabbi Yochanan had 11 kids. All of them died, one after the other. And he never became crazy. Not only that, he, to, he took the tooth out of the last one, one tooth, and he went from one shiva call to the other. People sitting shiva, he comes, he say, hey, you just bury one kid. I know, I feel bad for you, but look at me, I buried 10 or 11, I'm not sure what was the number. And they say, really? So why you came to you know, to comfort us. He said, no, I feel so bad for you because I see you, you upset. But, I, but don't worry, you know, soon you will see them. It's not the end of the world. He was cheering them up. And he never became crazy. When he became crazy, when? When his Chavruda died, when Rish Lakish died. Why? They gave everyone who they sent to learn with him, everything Rabbi Yochanan said, they said, yes, Rabbi, you're right. That's the answer. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. So he said, get out of here! I need you to, tell, to confirm what I, what I teach. Where is Rish Lakish? He used to walk in the street and scream, Rish Lakish. His name was Shimon Lakish. His nickname was Rish Lakish. Rabbi Shimon Ben Lakish, where are you? Where did you go? When I said something, you ask 18 questions right there. I didn't know where to start. I had a challenge in my learning. Now everybody who come, yes, man. Yes, yes, like this. <laughs> like a robot. I don't need them. So the rabbis made a committee, all of them together, they started to pray every day for him to die. Why? They saw how he suffered. They said, Hashem, have mercy on him, take him to heaven. And when he died, the story was over. This is Rabbi Yochanan, and in the end he married his sister. And one time Rabbi Yochanan came to the yeshiva and he was very upset. So the ex-gangster told him, what happened? You're not learning as usual today. So yeah, I, I was mad. Some of the criminals here on the corner, they stole my wallet. So, so people who don't understand the Gemara, they think, ah, he lost 200 bucks, so now he cannot think about the learning. He's upset about the money. No, that wasn't what, that's not what he was upset. He was upset because he knew this Mishnah. The hand is riding and the collectors are coming to collect. I just was, I just lost 200 or 500, whatever it was. That means Hashem sent me a collector. That means I made a sin. And I'm, I'm dying to know what sin did I make that I had to lose my wallet. Any surin belochet. Nothing happened just like that. That means I'm guilty of something. If Hashem sent me a robber to me and not to him, that means I'm guilty. And it kills me. Because I'm trying never to be guilty. Not even once in my life. That means I'm guilty of something. That's the idea. So Rish Lakish told him, give me five minutes. He went to the street, he got two of the criminals and said, you have ten minutes. I need the wallet back in my hand. If not, I burn this whole neighborhood. <laughs> two minutes later, the wallet was in his hand. He came back to the Shiva and said, here, Rabbi, here is your wallet. So, Nachadato, which means he, he, he relaxed. Why? What I thought that I'm guilty of something, it turns to be not true. I'm not guilty of anything. So why did Hashem do it to me? A test. Sometimes it's a test. Hashem wants to see how you react. You came out of the learning in the morning, the tow truck is waiting to throw your car. Hey, don't touch, don't, don't touch, hey! It's too late, I picked up the car, you know the tricks. I already started to ride. <laughs> you know, if it was his brother and he didn't know and his brother came out, it doesn't matter that he started to ride. But when it's you, he started to ride. So this is it. That's this, the secret of this Mishnah. The hand of Hashem is riding everything. Ayn Ro'ah, there's an eye who watch over you, Ozen Shomad, Bechol Maasecha Vasefer Nichtavim. There's a ear who listens, 
and everything you do is being written in the book of Hashem. One poor guy was very hungry, was looking for food, and he saw a mezuzah in a nice fancy house, and he knocked on the, on the door, and one guy opened the, the door, and he said, can you give me some food? I'm starving all day. So the rich guy said, no problem, yeah, I can feed you. I can feed you a great meal. But I do not like to give things for free. I'm a businessman. Why don't you earn it? Why you need Zdaka? Come, I'll give you a job. So he said, that poor man is almost fainting. So what job? Clean my garage. It's all a mess, dust, everything on the floor. Clean all the shells, put everything in the right order, sweep the floor, finish the garage, make it like a pharmacy. You can eat as much as you want. The poor guy, with the last energy remained in him, he went and cleaned the entire garage. He made it like beautiful. Then he comes back to the rich guy, he said, no, give me food. So he said, don't worry, go across the street, you see that door? Go inside. There's a table with anything that you want to eat. Fish, meat, anything you want, you eat, you drink, you fool, you live. Okay, thank you very much. He goes across the street, he comes in. See beautiful food, wow, delicious. He eats, he eats. Smokes comes out, out of his ears already. He's okay for a week now. He's about to go out. Then somebody from upstairs scream. I never saw such an ungrateful person like you. You're about to live without even saying thank you after all the food we fed you. He looks up, he sees somebody up there. We got angry. He said, you have the nerve to tell me I'm grateful? What, did you give me something for free? You killed me for this. I walked two hours, my whole body is broken. So now when I got paid for what I deserve, you're telling me I'm ungrateful? So the guy said, you worked? I, don't even, I never saw you before. What work? I said, what do you mean? Who, where did you work? I said, across the street, in the garage. I said, oh, he fooled you also? <laughs> this guy is a character. Everybody who comes hungry and knock on his door, he makes him do something for him, then he sends him to us to feed him. This is a Bet Tamchui, my friend. This is an open orphan house for all the people, the homeless from the street. Whenever they're hungry, they come, they eat for free as much as they want. All they have to do is to say thank you and to leave. So he said, you want to tell me that I worked for nothing? He said, absolutely, my friend. You work for nothing because you're ignorant. If you knew about what's going on here, you wouldn't work. Why do I tell you this story? The secret in the story is, this is exactly what this world is. The food is ready for every individual in this world. Jews, non-Jews, it doesn't matter. Everybody has his meal always ready for you. For him, for his children, for his wife. Everything he needs. Car, uh, rug, chairs, you know, anything he needs. Clothes, outfits, food, whatever he needs. There's two ways to get it. One is to go directly and take it. No obligation. And one, to go through struggle, to go to work, and then get it. Now, how are you going to get what you deserve to get anyway? It's your free choice. How you make your choices based on your knowledge. If a person learns Torah for a few years, he learns emuna and confidence in Hashem, he realized that all he has to do is a little effort. What does it mean to come, knock on the door, go inside, sit and eat? That's it, a little effort. You cannot expect them to deliver the food to you. So you walk there and you eat. A little bit effort. If you don't believe in Hashem, you think that you're making your money, then you go to clean the garage first for two hours to get something that was ready for you anyway. You understand? This is the difference between the Torah scholars to the business people. The business people, sometimes they love Hashem, they believe in Hashem, they keep mitzvot, everything is fine. But if they go one step higher in Emunah, they will work a lot less. They have confidence in Hashem, they'll make the same amount of money or even more. It's 100% in the level of your Emunah. If you have a muna, you don't have to put too much effort. The higher your confidence in God is, the less efforts you have to do in everything in life, not only business and money, about finding a soulmate, 
about raising children, about everything you do. If you have faith in Hashem, you don't have to kill yourself. You just make a little bit effort and you leave it alone. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it's not in my head. I did what I have to do a little bit. Don't kill yourself. Some people work five different jobs. Finish here, goes to this job. Finish there, two o'clock at night, he's still cleaning offices. What for? What for? Because he thinks, he makes the money. So you understand, every extra hour, I will make more. I make 10,000 hours. So if I work five hours, it's only 50. If I work 10, I'll make 100. I need 100, so I have to work extra five hours. Baloney. You can work a little bit, and the rest count on Hashem. He will somehow provide it. Same thing, it's not only about hours of work. It's about many different things I will do. I'll give you an example. Some business people, they save money all the time. Let's say they make $20,000 a month, and their expenses is seven, eight thousand. dollars So every month, they have another $12,000 going back into their account, into the principal. They try to live very, very simple life, not to waste money because they want to grow. So he always tells his wife, don't waste money, wait five years. When we get to one million, then we won't have to worry anymore because from the amount of money that I'm investing in a business, we will have a lot more income. For instance, if he makes 2% on his money a month, let's say, and right now he only have $100,000 in his fund. So how much is going to make? $2,000 a month. When, the t when 100,000 become a million, he's going to make 20,000 dollars a month, not two, right? This is the way they go in things. A Jew is not allowed to think like this. This is kfirah in Hashem. If you think that the more you're going to keep putting into the business, the more inventory you put, the more stores you will open, the more money you lend out and you make interest, then obviously I will go. It's baloney. You have to put some efforts. If Hashem wants you to make $20,000 a month, you can make it with a $100,000 investment. You can make it with a million dollar investment. The investment, it's an illusion. It's just an excuse for Hashem to send you the money. Naturally, of course, if you, make a, if you have a million invested, it should bring more money. Naturally. But naturally applies only to the Goyim, not to the Jews. Jews are above nature. Remember this all your life. When Hashem wants a Jew to make money, some student with $5,000 developed a computer software and sold it to Microsoft for $30 million and he doesn't have to work for the rest of his life. A one Jew invented Facebook. I don't have to tell you how much it worked. Or, or, or YouTube and all these companies. It's all mainly smart young kids that develop all this website. And today they want tens of billions of dollars. Why? If Hashem wants you to make money, it's not necessarily depend on the investment, on how much money you start with. You can take $50,000, and from the same $50,000, you, you sponsor all your family for 30 years. Why? You make money, and the next month you make money, and you don't have to go. If you think that the more you're gonna have, the more you're gonna make, that means that's what the Torah warned. Don't ever dare to say Hashem say that I'm making the money. Everything that I have, Hashem sent me FedEx Express. Not because I'm smart, not because I'm a sharp businessman, not because not none of that. Because Hashem wanted me to eat the same way he wanted the elephant to eat. The same went the same way the Indian that kissed the feet of Buddha every day, the Hashem feeds him, he also feeds you the Jew that comes to pray and to learn Torah. If he feeds that one who bowed down to an idol that he cannot stand him, what do you expect? That he won't feed the Jew? What do you expect? I always tell people, why are you so afraid to close the business on Shabbat? You're afraid that you'll be starving on the street? That means you don't even, you didn't even start to believe in Hashem. Not that you're not a great believer. You didn't even start. You're not a believer. You're zero, 100%. Zero. You're not even one. Why? Because this is what you're saying. You're saying this Indian that kiss the feet of Buddha and drink the pee of the cow every day for breakfast, Hashem gave him $10 million a year because he sells few diamonds, few glasses here in Belgium, and he travels a little bit to shows and sells it. Well. So Hashem sent him $10 million, even though Hashem cannot look at him that fool, that worship his idols. But me, the Jew, the son of God, that would listen to my father in heaven and not violate Shabbat, is the eternal covenant, I'm going to be poor. Why? 
because I knew what Hashem, the provider of Parnasa to everybody, told me to do. No. This is a religious guy. No, between me and you. This is he, somebody like this that thinks like this can call himself religious. It's a complete fool. What religious? Religion, to be religious, you have to be smart. To be religious, you have to be smart. If you're very foolish, you cannot be religious. I always say, when people tell me, I want you to speak to this guy, I want you to speak to this guy, it's the first question I ask. Is he smart, intelligent or not? Why? Because I know how long it's going to take me. If he's a sharp guy, rational, that looks at the things, understand right away, I know 20, 30 minutes, the, the case is closed to prove to him that the Torah is divine. If he's a fool, it may take me a whole day. Why? He doesn't see things right. He doesn't see. But smart, yeah, I told you once, I went to wash my car in Little Neck Car Wash in Northern Boulevard before Great Neck. Seven minutes. I took one kibbutznik from Petashita. He didn't even know who was Noah. What else you expect? Nothing. The Chinese in China are not Torah better than him. Seven minutes is a rabbi in Israel today. Why? He has the brain. He did not have the knowledge. You get the best computer in the world, the best laptop, the best memory, the best engine, the best everything. But you did not enter any knowledge. Rabbi, rabbi, have the best computer. Yeah, but start putting some things in it. It's empty. Same thing this guy. What does he have? Some nonsense from the kibbutz. Ashafan kibel nazelet. The rabbit is he has stuff he knows today. He didn't go to he didn't go to see his mommy. That's what they teach over there in, ki in kindergarten in elementary school. Your father is a monkey. Your grandfather is a gorilla. What did they teach in the kibbutz? Yes, well, on Pesach they eat bread and matzah at the same table. That's what it is. That's the truth. Not all the kibbutzim. Some kibbutzim are religious. Some kibbutzim are very anti-religious. I don't want to hear about religion. This guy, seven minutes, psh, right away. Why? Or sometimes you give, you know, the Ravuri Zohar in Israel, it was a very big movie star. It was a talk show on television. He was a producer. He was like the top of Hollywood in Israel. They even offered him to come to real Hollywood there to become something even bigger. Then he went to a wedding in Yerushalayim of one of his friends who became religious, and one of the rabbis started to talk to him in a dinner, in a table. The hour that they spoke, that was enough for him. He did not give him any rest. He, he just couldn't function anymore in his movies, in his jokes that he was making, and the money, and the television, and all the lifestyle that he had, like a celebrity, he knew it's empty. And it bothered him because he said always to himself, if this rabbi is right, I am finished. If he's right, it's a critical thing for me. I must prove to myself that he's wrong. As long as I cannot prove that he's wrong, I must do everything he told me based on this book. Just for the, for the doubt. Because if he's right, according to the Torah, how much I'm going to pay for what, for what I do now? for this little pleasure that I think that I have, the bill will be tremendous. So right away, he did not leave him. He went back and forth, back and forth. You see him today, Baruch Hashem. His wife, which was a very, very smart woman, with all the degrees from the best universities, she doesn't want to even smell religion. For two years, he become strictly religious, and she is completely anti-religious, husband and wife, in the same house. Two years later, he said to the rabbi, Rabbi, I cannot go on like this. Cut my marriage. No, let me, give me permission to divorce her. Let me start. She does not interest her. Cannot touch her. She doesn't go to the mikveh. Cannot hear, uh, eat her food. I have nothing to talk to her about anymore, because everything she knows from the university is against Hashem. It's all designed to speak against the religion over there. So why do I have a mutual with her? So the genius rabbi, if I could, I would go and kiss his hand for his brilliance. They told him, listen, it's all about ego. Don't confront her. She always would try to prove that she's better from her degrees and all this. Put the book of the Rambam on the table and get out of the house for hours. Just leave it there. That will be the trap. So I say, why? He said, you know, the Rambam speaks in a very high level. 
and all the secular Jews, one rabbi they all know, Rambam. You tell them Ramchal, not all of them know. You tell them Arizal, not all of them know. You tell them Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Akiva, not all of them knows. Rambam, everybody knows. Why? Because you have hospital Rambam in few places in Israel. Rambam Street, everywhere you go. School of Rambam, this Rambam. So you hear about Rambam because Rambam was also a genius in math, in astronomy, in philosophy, not only in religion. So even the secular Jews admire him in university, they mention him. All the other fanatic Jews that only care about religion, they're not so interested in them. This is the way they are. So I told them, leave the Rambam on, the science book. That's how his books are. Sefer Amada, 14 books. First one, science. Speaking about the creation, about Hashem, about the stars. Put it on the table and leave it, leave. Later, years after, she said how she became religious. So she said, I see a book on the table. I'm curious to see what my foolish husband is learning all day. <laughs> so, you know, as a woman who all my life learned in universities and good schools, I opened the first page and I started to read. What did I read? I cannot tell you because I did not understand that much. So when I realized that I read and I do not understand me with all my degrees, I say something, there's something in there. It's not, I never had such difficulty in university. Everything they gave me, one, two, three, I got it. I read the Rambam again and again. I don't understand his language. It's too deep for me. So that's when I started to read, to get involved. And the rest is today, she's even more righteous than him. I went to their apartment in my own, in one Shabbat when I was in, they live in Mattersdorf, in Yerushalayim. But just to show you, how it is. The more intelligent the person is, the chance to show him, to prove to him that the Torah is divine, is much higher. Why? You talk right away to a rational brain and you prove to him scientifically. However, some of them are convinced in their mind, but in their lips they always say the opposite. Why? Because if they admit, what comes next? The rabbi calls me to come for Shabbos. If I tell him, okay, Rabbi, I'm convinced the Torah is divine, you prove. What happens next? The Rabbi calls, so why you smoke on Shabbat? It invites pressure. Nobody wants pressure, so what's the easy way out? Ah, you didn't convince me. I don't know if you remember one time, one time I was sitting in Yeshiva, I said that in some of the lectures in the past, but probably you never heard that before. I'm sitting in Yeshiva, one guy comes inside, all right, my friend is outside, you have to talk to him inside, there's a lot of noise in yeshiva. So I said, okay, what, what did he say? No, he's not, he's anti-religion, he's an atheist, he's, he doesn't even want to put kippah here. He's a monster, everybody religious, he doesn't want to put kippah. And one of these guys that do on purpose, you know, to get you angry, come, I said, where will I talk to him? On the street? He said, let's sit in the car, you argue with him, he has questions. I went out, I'm starting to argue with him, I give him proof, slowly, slowly, it became a show of the town. You know, when all Hasidic Jews come and they see a guy with yarmulke, and a guy without the yarmulke arguing, right away becomes a show. From all over, up, all of a sudden we have an audience around the car, and me and him arguing in the middle afternoon. After maybe two, two and a half hours that I gave him the whole seminar, I got tired already. I saw this guy's ego is all the way up, he will never admit. Plus, I see is in his body language, which I learned that very good body language to see if the person really believes what he say or is lying on purpose. See, everything he says is the opposite of what he feels. It's yeah, you see right away. So I say, you know what, I have an idea, let's finish it. So I told him, okay, before we finish, I want to ask you one question. All these two, two and a half hours that we've been sitting here and talking, you want to tell me now that I did not change your mind even by 1%? Nothing? You're still an atheist? He said, absolutely. Not only you did not convince me in anything, now I know for sure that I'm right and the Torah is nonsense. So I said, okay, no problem. Just, I want you to do one favor to me. He said, what? I said, I would say one sentence and I want you to repeat after me and say amen. He said, okay. So I say, in the name of the writer of the book, which you say it's a nobody, right? In the name of the writer of the book, may all the curses and the sicknesses in this book 
will come on you and your children right away. Say Amen. He looks at me and he says, what? You cursing me? I'm cursing you? God forbid, who am I? I'm just saying this nonsense that you say it's nothing. The name of the writer of this book that wrote a list of sicknesses and he claimed he can bring it to people. May all the sicknesses that he threatened us here in the book will come on you. Say Amen. I'm not going to say Amen. What is this? I say, say Amen. Don't be a loser. Say Amen. No, yeah, no. All of a sudden, an explosion. He started to cry. You never saw a man cry like this. Trust me, I am crying. Like a nervous breakdown. I say, you got me. So you see that you're a liar. For two hours, you're already convinced after five minutes. But why you don't want to admit? You have an, an audience. You lose the battle. Plus, if you say, yeah, it's true, I'm going to tell you, no, come, get feeling, start to do something. So you're going to continue to go and lie to everyone and mainly to yourself until you ended up in hell. What did you get by all this show? That's what they don't get. In Hebrew, there is a great sentence that the secular Jews made. It's not in the Torah. They made it, but it's fantastic. What is it? Tzorchek. Beautiful, much beautiful. It should, it should be put in Pirkei Avot. <laughs> Pirkei Avot, if it was up to me, I would add it to one of the Mishnayot. What does it say? You laugh, I laugh. Who laughs in the middle of the battle doesn't matter. We only remember who will be laughing in the end when the battle is over. When two bucks are punching one another for ten rounds, he give you one, you give him one, he give you five, you are falling down in a minute. All this will never be remembered. In the end, people will remember only one thing. Who was going like this and who was falling on the floor dead. That's it. You can make a lot of shows. Rabbi, I enjoy my life. I just got a new jet ski. Tomorrow we go on Shabbat, me and my family, my yacht. If you want, you can join us. Somebody in Florida told me, why don't you, I told him, I, I don't go to vacations. I never went on vacation 15 years. What? I have a, a million dollar yacht. I have a captain. Why don't you bring your wife? And my captain will take you on the, on the yacht from Florida to the Bahamas. You can go anywhere you want. It's on me. Don't worry. <laughs> he thinks he's doing me a huge favor to waste a month of my life. <laughs> and I say, forget it, I'm not interested, sit on the, on the ocean, the captain drives us around. Well, what's the purpose of this? No oh, beautiful arm, the, the noise of the waves, the eagles, beautiful view, Florida, humidity, sauna, whatever. What do we get by that? After five hours you get tired of it. All these physical pleasures, from the minute you start, you begin to lose your appetite. Every bite, it's a little bit less tasty than before. First bite from the steak is very good. 100% pleasure. Second bite, 98%. Third bite, 95%. Until it gets to a point you vomit. You don't want to look at it. Please, I'm begging you, please don't. No more, no more. Hey, open your mouth. You're not getting anywhere. <laughs> you open your mouth, you eat the steak. This is it. So, heck, we should so heck acharon. Time is running out soon, so let's finish this parak at least. So the Mishnah continue. The Mishnah says like this. Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, he became the president of Israel when he was 18 years old. And he is a reincarnation of Samuel the prophet. Samuel died 52 years old, and he was 18. And that's, that's the one who speak in the Haggadah of Pesach and say, Are ani keben shivim shana. I am like 70 years old. I am like, I'm not 70 years old. I am like 70 years old. Why? Take my 52 years when I was Samuel, add the 18 years that I'm Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, and 70 years. So I'm like 70 because it's two lifetimes. My previous and my current. This is what he says. Im en Torah en derech eret. If there's no Torah, there is no manners. Cannot become a complete, polite, 
nice human being than the way you're supposed to, without Torah. No? Him and Derech Eretz and Torah. If there is no manners and no good traits, there is no Torah. Why? Because if you're an arrogant person, even if you learn Torah, it will not remain by you. Why? Because you're an arrogant person. So it's, a, it's like the, it's the question of the chicken and the egg. Who came first? Right? First was a chicken that gave birth to an egg, or first there was the first egg that the chicken came out. You understand? So what is it like? Torah brings manners. Manners bring Torah. You cannot live one without the other. It's a combination. If there's no Torah, there's no wisdom. If there's no wisdom, there's no fear from Hashem. Why? Foolish people are not afraid of anything. Needless to say that they're not afraid of some, somebody invisible. They're not afraid of anyone, because they're stupid. When I was a kid, I had a cousin. My cousin was rich and I was poor. Not poor, average, maybe in the low part of the average. Not poor, there were people that were a lot more poor, but average, like in the middle. But my cousin, his father was very rich. He had a store in a very busy area. They lived in a big private house. So he had nice car, nice clothes, and we were living simple life. Well, Hashem, we were not starving, but I was doing good in school as a kid, and he was a complete mess. Everything. In, in Hebrew, you have, in Israel, you have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, A, B, C. C is the Garua, Gimel, the worst. His thing was all Gimel, mine was almost everything Aleph. In the first three years, it was all Aleph. The teacher told my parents, don't come to parents' conference. Don't waste my time. Everything is fine, don't come. Like, that was the first three years until I became whatever I became. But in the beginning, it looked very good. Why I'm telling you this story? Because his father was a very, very proud person. Very proud, was the richest in the family. And his nature is very arrogant and brag about anything you can think of. Every second of his life is a show off. He wants to sing, he wants everyone to be quiet. He wants to say something about the news, he gets angry if somebody makes a beat. If the kids make some noise, it's like, how much? Like, he thinks he's a king. <laughs> so, he used to say all the time, my son is not like your son, he was telling my mother. Your son is a chicken. He's a coward. I took them on uh, a pool, I brought them up to the rock, and I said to my son, jump! He jumped. Your son, I'm trying to push him, he's crying, he's running away. Then, we climb on a tree, I told your son, jump, don't worry, I'm catching you. He's afraid to jump. My son, you see how he jumped. So my mother used to say to me, what is this? So I told her, you don't get it. To be a brave guy like his son, that means to be stupid. Jump from here, jump from there until you die. Somebody smart, he thinks ten times before he jump. He thinks a hundred times before he makes something dangerous. Why? For one minute pleasure or adventure, you'll be crippled for the rest of your life. You understand what's going on here? This is it. If there's no wisdom, there's no fear. The foolish people are never worried about stealing and raping and violating Shabbat. I'm a perfect rabbi. Not only do not worry, they think because they gave a thousand dollars to the shul in Yom Kippur that they sit with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai on the stage in the VIP section in heaven. Rabbi, and it's a dick. Why? What do you, what's the problem? I don't, I don't do any bad to anyone. You put filin? No. You keep Shabbat? No. You learn Torah? No. You have mezuzah, maybe. <laughs> Ani tzaddik. You know? That's it. No wisdom, no fear. No fear, no, no, no fear, no wisdom. Because fear from Hashem forces you to learn. Because Hashem told you, you must learn every day. It brings you wisdom, intelligence. Develop your intelligence, your wisdom, your knowledge. No wisdom, no da'at. I don't know if there's a word for the word that in English. Today I asked my wife, what's the right word for gmilut chasadim in English? After thinking for five minutes, she told me there's no word like this in English. You can say kind, 
The word Gomel Hasadim does not exist in English. It only exists in a divine religion and divine language, which is our language. It does not exist in other languages. Why? They don't have that concept that you have to always do for others. Gomel Hasadim, washing the dead bodies, helping the poor, cooking for this, helping the orphans, helping the widows, cleaning the, the shore. But they don't have this in their vocabulary. They don't know, kind, kind, it's like nice to other one. Gomel Hasadim, searching where, who could I help next? There's no word for it. Or maybe you know and I'm wrong. Tell me if you know. So, no intelligence, no wisdom, no that. What does it mean that? You have no intelligence and no wisdom. That means the ability to take everything you learned and to translate it into actions. Since you have nothing in your computer, obviously you cannot, trans you cannot transfer anything to actions. There's nothing in your head. How are you going to make it into actions? If I learn it's not good to steal, now I'm putting it on my desires. I'm, I want to steal, but my, my knowledge, my wisdom, and my intelligence convince me that it doesn't pay, because tomorrow I'll pay double. That's called wisdom that was translated into the correct actions. That's called da'at. Da'at kanita machasarta. If you have da'at, you, you are not missing anything. You don't have da'at, you don't have anything. Rabbi, I know all the football teams by heart. I tell you all the names of all the players. I tell you all the stock market companies. I tell you the president of every company. I tell you and I tell you, I tell you 300 telephone numbers by heart. I tell you the size of the Ferrari tires. I tell you the new uh, Bugatti that came in 1934. Who cares? All this knowledge you take with you to where you're going to end it up with. It's not going to gain you anything. You know one Mishnah, it's already better than all these telephone numbers and all these news that you know. What is it? You have to put your efforts in gaining the right knowledge. The right knowledge will make you a better person. And if not, you miss the purpose. Even that, now it's going in reverse. If you cannot translate it into actions, you're not becoming righteous. If you're not righteous, your wisdom is getting affected, you begin to lose it, it's vice versa. It goes up and it also goes down, it's interesting. You should know, knowledge makes you righteous. Being righteous brings you knowledge. Not being righteous making you lose your knowledge. It's not staying by you, it's like having a hole in a bucket. Imen kemach, if there's no flower, then Torah. There's no Torah. If you don't have what to eat, how are you going to learn? Starving. You cannot focus. Look, in Yom Kippur, while everyone is dizzy, can you learn Torah? Yom Kippur, 7 in the evening. How many people can sit and learn Gemara, Rashi? The head is not functioning. So, that's what the Chilonim love. Bye-bye, we have to work also. What? If you don't have Parnassah, you cannot learn Torah. That's the first half of the sentence. What's the other half of the sentence? And Torah and Kemach. There's no Torah, there's no flower. No flower, no Torah, it's true. You have to have some Parnassah. No Torah, no Parnassah. You don't learn Torah, you lose from your Parnassah, guarantee. The more you learn, the more blessed you are. Sometimes you make less, but it's a blessed. Somebody make ten times more than you and doesn't see one minute of rest with all his belongings and incomes, only problems and agony. Who I Omer, he continue and say, Kol Every person that his wisdom is higher than his actions. He knows a lot, but he does only 20-30% of what he knows. What is it like? Knowing the entire Torah and the Shulchan Aruch and all the Musar, and doing only 10, 20 percent of it, what do you, what does it make you look like? Like a tree with tons of branches, many different branches expanding to all sides, and the roots only few roots, very very little roots. What happened to that tree? One wind comes and the tree flies to the neighbor's head across the street. Why? The roots yes, do not make the tree stable. Then, somebody that his actions are even more than his knowledge, 
He does everything he's been told, even if he doesn't understand. Because that's what Hashem said, that's what the rabbi told me to do, I do. What is it like? A tree with not too many branches, but very, very strong and deep roots, that any hurricane that comes cannot move the tree an inch. What's better? A tree with tons of fruit and tons of branches, but one wind comes and the tree flies 300 miles away? Oh, not that much, but the roots are very solid and they cannot move the tree even one inch. So the answer to all these secrets here is actions comes before knowledge. It's more important. Just to know not to do, not good. Just to do not to know, also not good, but better than the other option. Better to do not knowing than know a lot and not do. Because knowing a lot and not doing makes you a, 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 a wicked person on purpose. Not innocently, on purpose, because you know and you're not doing. Doing not knowing makes you foolish, because you do not know, but you do the right thing. A fool that did the right thing. It's much better than a wicked that knew and did not do anything. We almost finished. Mamash, another minute. Rabbi Eliezer says, It's hard for me to read. Rabbi Eliezer says like this. I will say it first in Hebrew and then I'll translate. Kinin ufitche nida hen hen gufe alachot, kufot ve gimatriot parperaot la chokma. This is the end of chapter 3. We finish it. Next week we're going to start chapter 4, so we have chapter 4, 5, and 6, and we're done. Uh, let's explain what it means. The main, the main Torah is the oral Torah. Many people think the written Torah is holy, Rabbi, I kiss it, I stand, when I take it out, I rise. Sometimes I'm so excited I even have tears when I see it. It's beautiful. But the written Torah is worthless without the oral laws, the instructions. Worthless, but much nothing. It's no meaning. You cannot understand one verse without the oral explanation on it that Hashem gave to Moshe in Ar Sinai. Many go in once to worship Hashem and read the Torah literally and follow it. Like in Saudi Arabia, if a kid will steal, they chop his hand off. Why? Because the Torah says hand for an end. They do not have the oral laws. So then translate, hand for an end. You stole, let's chop your hand and put it. That's not what the Torah meant. And for an end, I for an eye means the value, value, money or value. Which means you took someone's eye out, now you have to evaluate what was his profession. If he's a person that uh, writing Sifre Torah without his eyes, he cannot work anymore. So you put him out of commission. You have to evaluate the total damage that you made besides the doctor bills and whatever he needs to be cured, if it's possible and to pay him an eye for an eye. But if it's a person that doesn't need his eye so much, doesn't need his eye so much, let's see, he's all day sleeping in his bed. What did he lose by not having eye? Just the beauty of the world. So the court evaluates compensation, how much you have to pay him. That's called an eye for an eye. Depends what you do with this. If you have a hand and you're working with his hand, so now the hand has a value. If you make a million dollars a year, they have to evaluate how much the loss of the hand how much it's worth to dollars, to money. And if you make $20,000 a year, so the damage was 20,000 times how many years an average person lived, it's a much bigger, much smaller damage. This is what the Torah meant, but without the oral law, you would never know. The Torah says, Do not cook the meat in the milk of his mother. So it appears in the Torah three times. If you did not have the oral Torah, what did you think? Hashem was bored. He, didn't, he wanted to fill up the Torah, it was too short. He wanted to make it a little bit longer, like some of the people who write books. After they finish, it's only 30 pages. Nobody will buy such a book. People pay 20 bucks. They want to get something. They give them a little tiny book. So they begin to push nonsense. Yeah, well, repeat it. Page 40 is like page 1. People forget. They know people don't read it in one shot. 
they read it today, next time you read chapter 2 will be in 5 years. So it's good, it's like it's starting all over. I always tell people, write it short to the point, don't waste my time. I have to go through the whole book and take my yellow marker and mark maybe 1% of what you wrote. What for? The same thing you could have said in 10 pages. But they're not going to do it because they're not going to be able to sell. The longer it is, people feel I get more for my money. More papers. That's what it is. So the Torah says three times because one time to teach you, you're not allowed to eat it. If somebody cooks for you meat and milk together, boiling together in a pot or whatever, not allowed to eat. Second time it appears to teach you that you're not allowed to cook it even for a goy. Goy came to you and he wants you in a microwave to make him, I don't know, uh, pasta with the melted cheese and some uh, cold cuts. Not allowed to make for him. Well, I'm not touching it. I don't touch it. It's against the Torah, but for Ahmed I do. Not allowed to make it. You're not allowed to mix it in a world. Even for the dog, you're not allowed to make it. And the third time that it appears that if you made a mistake and made it, if you made a pepperoni pizza and now somebody told you, hey, it's not, it's not allowed. Or you cooked something with milk, like chicken in, uh, in butter, or I don't know, like, you know, you know, they make what with cream or something, steak with cream. You didn't know it's not allowed. It's, uh, Rabbi just walked in, what are you doing? It's not allowed. Oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. Okay, no, forgive you, forgive you. Now what's, it's 40 bucks, this meal. Let me sell it to Ahmed. I'll get my ingredients back at least. The raw steak, the, the melted chef. Now, the so the third time it appears in the Torah to teach you that if you made a mistake and did it, you're not allowed to enjoy from it in any way, which means you're not allowed to sell it, you're not even allowed to give it to your dog to eat. Why? Because if the dog will eat it, it will be full for in a few hours. It will save you a few bucks. That's a pleasure. Not allowed. That's why it appears in the Torah three times. Without the oral Torah, you ever had an idea that that's what God meant in the Torah? The Goyim don't have the oral Torah, they have no understanding, nothing whatsoever. One woman sent me an email, he said in your lecture that only the Jews know how to keep Shabbat and only the Jews keep Shabbat, but the Goyim, why the Christians do not keep Shabbat, she says. So we, the seventh day is Adventist, we keeping Shabbat on, the, on Friday night until Saturday night. And we keep everything like the Jews. So I wrote to her, you think you are. And you have no idea what Shabbat is. So she said, why? We do this, we do this. So I said, well, all the other people in your cult, when I spoke to them, they did not know one of the rules of Shabbat. I'm not blaming them. If they had it, I'm sure they would learn and do. Because if they're already willing to keep Shabbat, believe me, they'll do everything. But they do not know. Even if they want to do it, they do not know, because they don't have the oral laws. The oral laws went from father to son only in yeshivot. It wasn't on a shelf everywhere you wanted, that the goy comes and learn all the laws of Shabbat. Today, if a goy really, really is serious, he can go to a Jewish book and buy books and learn 100% how to keep Shabbat. Today it's possible, with all the massive amount of books that we have. But a thousand, two thousand years, who would have it? Nobody would have it. Oh Hashem, we finish for today. Thank you for coming. I do not know about next Monday if I'll be able to have a lecture because I'm going to Belgium and I'm only coming back Monday. I do not know what time I land, if I'll be able to come right away to do a lecture. So I will let you know, Levi, and we'll let you know. We, anyway, we announce on Monday if there's a shiur. So you get an email if there is a shiur or a text. If not, we'll meet you in the following Monday. Thank you very much and call to. Thank you, Levi. Thank you, everybody. Okay.